We bless the Lord for the privilege of worship. We're so delighted that God has given us another opportunity to assemble together to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Certainly we don't take this opportunity for granted. He didn't have to do it, but I'm so glad that he did. David said it, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And we thank God for the privilege to our ministers that share with us and to officers, to our choir singing out of their hearts and I urge you so graciously serving along with our healthcare ministry and media ministry, and to each of you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, praise God for your presence. We know that uh, forecasted rain and now even another storm, which you thought it not robbery to be in the house of the Lord. And one of the safest places we can be is in the house of the Lord. And we can give God praise in advance for what we desire for him to do in providing for our protection and provision. Please continue to remember all of our sick and shed in in prayer, as well as those who have been impacted by the previous storm, that God will continue to bring restoration in their lives. Let me invite your attention this morning to two passages of scripture. Uh, first one is Psalm 23 and verse number five. Psalm 23, verse 5, and then I'd like to couple that passage with Luke, chapter 22, verse 19. Luke, chapter 22, verse 19. Let me acknowledge so many of our young people in the house this morning. It's just good to see. Let's praise God for them. It's good to see young people serving the Lord even on a Sunday, other than that there is Sunday. <laughs> we praise God for them. Psalm 23, verse 5 says, Thou prepareth a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. In verse number 19 of chapter 22. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Thank you so much. You may be seated. I want to share for a few moments from the subject an expensive free meal. Say that with me, an expensive free meal. What is the most you've ever paid for a single meal? Was it $25? Was it $50 or even $100? What we pay for meals often depends upon what is being ordered and where it is being served. There are many places in the world where a diner can sit at a beautifully decorated table and dine in an elaborate atmosphere. But that table and atmosphere are far from being cheap. They cause you to have to dig deep in your pockets. There are many tables in fine restaurants that are reserved only for those who can really afford them. In fact, such places don't even have prices on the menus because those who sit at those tables are not concerned about price. They are only concerned about atmosphere and service. So meals such as those can be expensive. 
at the now closed Floors Burgers in Las Vegas. The famous Floors Burger sold for $5,000. It contained a Kobe beef patty with a cube of seared fios gras, shaved black truffles, and a truffle spiked special sauce on it all buttery brioche bond. And as a bonus, it came with a bottle of 1990 Chateau Petrus wine. The restaurant in New York's Parker Meridian Hotel features a breakfast egg dish that contains six eggs, a lobster tail from Maine, and 10 grams of caviar. The cost of this breakfast dish without the orange juice is a thousand dollars. While you're in New York, you can walk a few blocks from the breakfast bar and go to a place called Serendipity Three. There you can purchase a Sunday, not a regular Sunday, but one that features Madagascar vanilla bean flavored ice cream with cocoa chunks from the Venezuelan coast. Toppings on your Sunday will include candy from Paris based for Sean, and a trio infused caviar, passion fruit, orange, served with 23 carat gold decorative leaves and a golden spoon. Price for your Sunday, $1,000. In Manhattan, there's a place called Nino's Bellissima that specializes in luxury pizzas. It features chunks of lobster tail, creme fraiche, and four types of caviar. It costs $33 a bite or $1,000. Well, if that's too rich for your blood, there is a resort hotel in Las Vegas that specializes in a $500 pot pot that contains yellowtail, crab, and bluefin tuna served in a custom-made pot. And for an extra $95, you can get one scoop of white truffle ice cream for dessert. Now, there is no guarantee that these expensive items will appeal to your taste or that that $1,000 pizza will taste any better than the $7 pizza delivered to your door. But there are some folk that think paying more for something always means that it is better. It may be exotic, it may be different, it may be tasty, but not necessarily better. There are folk who are recipients of free meals, courtesy of a friend who decides to provide a treat. Yours truly is one of those people who benefit from people who are gracious at providing meals to us. The meal may have been free to me, but someone had to pay the price. In Psalm 23, David said, he prepareth a table for me in the presence of my enemies. That meal has been served to us many times but it was not free. What if God charged us for the bounty we received? How much would it cost? Could we afford it? Suppose we had to pay for blessings. What if heaven placed a price on answered prayer? Would there ever be specials or buy one, get one free? <laughs> would we need a layaway plan? The good news is that the table that God prepares before us every day is available to us without charge. But it does have a price. But that price has already been paid. As believers, we're happy to know that the Savior has made the bounties of heaven available to us without charge, including the opportunity for eternal life. It's free to us, but it was not cheap. 
Thankfully, Jesus paid it all. That's what the songwriter said. Jesus paid it all. And all to him I owe. Well, this text focuses on the Lord's last supper with his disciples. When Jesus and his disciples met in the upper room, they thought they were meeting to keep the 1500 year tradition of celebrating the Passover. The traditional meal and its accompanying ceremony had been passed down through the generations since Moses. Jews were told to prepare a memorial meal that was to commemorate their deliverance from slavery. The meals were simple, but elaborate in its preparation. In general, here is the procedure. Lambs were roasted on a wooden pit with pomegranate wood so that it would not have any sap. No bone was allowed to be broken and the meat was not to come in contact with any foreign substance. If so, that portion had to be cut away. Unleavened cakes of bread were prepared along with bitter herbs and four cups of wine per person. The meal was not eaten until midnight. The Passover meal in practical terms probably cost less than $50 for all 13 of the participants. If it was only the Passover that was being celebrated, the meal's cost could be measured in dollars. But Jesus carried the Passover further. The meal was no longer to commemorate their exodus from slavery, but the bread was to represent his body and the wine would represent his blood, both of which would be given in sacrifice by Christ to ensure salvation for everyone. The fact that the elements on the table represents the body and the blood of Jesus Christ places a higher value on them than just $50. It was expensive because it required the life of the only begotten Son of God. Yet, despite the cost, Jesus paid the price and offered salvation to humankind, free of charge. Well, let me submit to you this morning the fact that God sets many tables before us, and many of them resemble tables set for other believers. First of all, let me suggest that there is what I call a miracle table. When Jesus preached to 5,000 people out in a desert place, there was no way to feed 5,000 people from a human perspective. There were no Winn-Dixie grocery stores. There were no public supermarkets. There were no Applebee's. There were no Carabas Italian grills. There were no golden corrals. However, there was a little boy with two fish and five loaves of bread who presented them to the disciples. In Jesus' hand, they fed everyone, 5,000 people, and had food left over. That's a miracle table. It may not have been two fish and five loaves of bread, but we have all experienced a miracle of God's provision. We've seen him show up and we've seen him help us to take a little and stretch it further than we imagined. Who would have thought that without food stamps or government assistance in any way that black families could have survived slavery, reconstruction, the depression, two world wars, and life-threatening situations with the little that we own? It's those miracle meals that our great-grandmas prepared, cooking stuff that was not supposed to be eaten, and storing stuff in jars that would have gone to waste. It's those miracle meals in which she recreated something new out of old cornbread and leftover turkey trimmings. And we came up with dressing. God prepared a table before us in hard times and seemed to always have a way to keep food 
on our tables. Today, God is still showing us how to take a little and make it go further. But not only is there a miracle table, but there's also something that I call a Job's table. You remember Job. Job was a righteous man who lived according to God's will. Yet there came a time in Job's life when Job's faith was tested and Satan was allowed to dabble in his life. One day while eating, Job received one piece of bad news after the other. His children had been killed. His cattle were stolen. And finally his health began to deteriorate. Job's plate that once overflowed with provision and opportunity now seemed filled with misfortune. Yet, even then he declared, yea, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. There will come a time when each of us will be served something that is distasteful. No one likes death. No one likes sickness. No one likes hardship. No one likes frustration or difficulty, but it is served in every life. Doesn't matter who you are and where you've come from, you cannot escape the cares of this life. It comes with living. Job's plate shows us that even good people can suffer misfortune. The key is to remain faithful and believing that God can and will change the menu. He did that for Job, and he'll do it for you as well. I suppose that's what the songwriter meant when he said, trouble don't last always. So there's a miracle table, and there's a Job table. But there's a third table that I call the Belshazzar's table, Nebuchadnezzar. You remember the evil pagan king? When he conquered Jerusalem, he ordered a great feast in celebration to highlight his own power and to accentuate his arrogance. He insisted on adorning his table with the golden vessels from the temple of God. And that would be like taking the Lord's Supper communion trays and having a party with them, as opposed to using them for the purpose in which they were intended. He was being arrogant in his disposition, uh, exercising his power and control because these vessels were dedicated to the worship of the Most High God. As he sat at his table, he saw the handwriting on the wall that warned him that his days were numbered. Even today, many folk have been shown the handwriting on the wall, but they have ignored it. Some folk have chosen to live outside of God's will and are presently enjoying themselves, feasting on the best that this life has to offer. But the handwriting is on the wall. The table is set before them, a table of warning. He met his fall that very night. And the time is approaching in the lives of many men and women today. If they were wise, they would heed the warning. Don't put off for tomorrow what need to be done today. Seeking the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. So then there's a miracle table. There's the Job's table. Then there's the Nebuchadnezzar's table. But there's a fourth table that I call the wilderness table. While Israel wandered in the wilderness, God provided for their survival in a miraculous way. There was manna and quail meat for them each and every day. They didn't know how it happened, but God was always there to provide for them. God does the same thing for us today. He prepares a wilderness table for each of us. As we move through our wilderness journey, God takes care of the faithful. He opens doors that we cannot see and makes a way out of no way. Some of us have been blessed with opportunities beyond our imagination. And every day we get blessings that we do not expect. We sing that song freely. Great is thy faithfulness. 
Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord, unto me. In our wilderness experience, God provides all that we need, proving that he's surely a way maker. Is there anybody here that knows he is a way maker? So there's the miracle table. There's the Job's table. There's the Nebuchadnezzar or Belshazzar's table. There is the wilderness table. But then finally, my brothers and sisters, there is one more table that has been set before us that is an affordable table because it is a table of salvation. It is an expensive table, but it comes without cost. While it is true that the Passover meal may have served 13 people for less than $50, that cannot be said of the Lord's supper table. Why? Because this meal represents the table of salvation. And it came with a high price. Jesus paid it all. The table of salvation is different from the table set before Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. It offered the knowledge of good and evil, but there was no salvation. The table of salvation is different from the table set before Isaac by his deceptive son, Jacob. That table was filled with venison and lies, but there was no salvation. The table of salvation is different from the table set before the three Hebrew boys with all of the best foods at the king's table. They refused that table because it was filled with fine meats, but there was no salvation. On the table of salvation is the bread of heaven. It's the same bread that Jesus promised would satisfy our thumb. Since the table of salvation requires bread, the old warriors declared bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I won't no more. On the table of salvation is the blood of Jesus. It's the same blood that Jesus shed for the remission of sin. This is the same blood that the old warriors sang about when they said, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There may be someone thinking that the table of salvation is too high. That is beyond their reach. Though the table of salvation is expensive, the price tag for interest into the kingdom of heaven is absolutely free. Why? Because Jesus paid it all. Sin had left its crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. He paid it all by picking up an old rugged cross and going to a hill called Calvary. He paid it all by dying for our sins. Anybody here glad he died? I'm so glad he died. He paid it all. But every Sunday morning, he got up out of the grave with all power in his hand. Salvation came at a great cost. But the good news is, Jesus paid it all. He paid for our awful actions. He paid for our evil thoughts. He paid for our envious eyes. He paid for our devilish deeds. He paid for our hateful hearts. He paid for our wayward ways. Is there anybody here glad that Jesus paid the price for you? I was on the wrong road, traveling in the wrong direction didn't have God on my side. I was too mean to live and not fit to die. But he picked me up, turned me around, placed my feet on solid ground. Is there anybody here that will testify 
that you were lost in sin. You are on your way to hell. But thanks be to God, Jesus loved you so much until he reached way down to pick you up. And now here you are, living abundant living. I'm so glad that Jesus made it possible for us to enjoy the abundant life. The Bible says that the thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said that I am come that you might have a life and that you might have it more abundantly. Anybody here glad you are enjoying an abundant life? I'm so glad that Jesus made it possible. When God saves us, that's not the end of the story. Just like when a baby is born, he's born as an infant. And I heard somebody say, all babies uh, are cuddly and cute. But I don't care how cute and how cuddly your baby is. You don't want them to stay a baby. You want them to evolve into a toddler. You want them to evolve into a child. You want them to evolve into adolescence and finally to maturity. But that's the way God is with his children. He don't want us to stay babes in Christ, but he want us to feast from the table of salvation. Well, preacher, how do you feast from the table of salvation? By feasting on the word of God. Is there anybody here that knows there's power in the word of God? There's joy in the word of God. There's peace in the word of God. And when you feast off of the word of God, you grow in grace and in the knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and give you the tools and the weapons you need to stand against the attacks of the devil. When the devil comes against you, uh, go down in the word. And when he tries to depress you and get you to host your own pity party, you go down in the word. And the word tells you weeping may endure for a night, but oh joy will come in the morning. I'm so glad I'm feasting off of the word of God. Thank God. For his word. Thank God for his word. Anybody here glad? Are you glad that God made it available for you? Taste and see that the Lord is good. In the Lord good. Won't he walk with you? Won't he talk with you? Won't he hold you? In the middle of the night. Is he all right? Is he all right? Can you say yes? Can you say yes? I know he's all right. Go ahead and give God praise. Thank God for preparing a table for us in the very presence of our enemies. The devil is all around us. He don't want to see you succeed. He don't want to see you live a victorious life. But if you continue to stay focused on God, on God's word, continue to get a refilling of the Holy Spirit. Well, preacher, what do you mean by that? The Bible says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. A person that is drunk on the wine is under the influence of the wine. He's under the influence of the alcohol. That's why it's against the law to drink and drive because you don't have control of your faculties. Well, when you're filled with the Spirit, it simply means that you are under the control of the Spirit. 
And how do you do that? By allowing the word of God to be the basis of your decision-making process on a daily basis. Learn how to live according to the word. Walk according to the word. And God's word will penetrate your very being and you become more conformed into the image of his son. We thank God for making it available to us. You don't have to remain the same. You can go to higher heights. You can go to deeper depths in the Lord. As an old deacon of our church used to sing, every round goes higher and higher. Can't you look back over your life and see that he's sweeter than the day before. He just keeps getting sweeter to me. He's, he, he just keeps allowing me to become closer and conform to him. And we thank God for his word. God, our Father, we thank you for this table that you have prepared for us. Everything we need is at your table. Salvation is at your table. Love is at your table. Peace is at your table. Joy is at your table. Understanding is at your table. A spirit of long suffering is at your table. We thank you for preparing this table for us. And even though it was a costly endeavor, you made it possible for us by paying it on our behalf. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We magnify your name. Continue to motivate us and inspire us to spread the word that others can come and take advantage of what we have. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor in Jesus' name. Amen. The doors of the church are open.